the Christian tradition has Catholics, Orthodox, and Protestants. Each one has something that the other one doesn't have because we have a divided Christendom, a divided church, and that's a sin. It's our fault, and only the Holy Spirit can fix it. But meanwhile, in the divided church, every other tradition has something that my tradition needs. And Catholics, I mean, Protestants need Catholic and Orthodox. They do. But Catholics and Orthodox need Protestants. Well, hey, everyone, what is up? Welcome or welcome back to my channel. My name is Austin. This is Gospel Simplicity, a place where we're passionate about the beautiful simplicity and transformative power of the gospel. And whether you're new or you've been watching maybe for some time and you just haven't yet, if these videos seem like something you're enjoying or you think you'll enjoy, I encourage you to maybe hit subscribe to become a part of this community here at Gospel Simplicity. I love getting to do this. And to everyone who has already subscribed, thank you so much. You're you subscribing helps push these videos out to more people, and if you're feeling crazy, you could even hit that notification bell, which will alert you, but also tell YouTube that these videos are worth watching, so they'll push them to people. Anyway, I really appreciate when people do those things. Today, you're about to see an interview with Dr. Philip Carey. He is a philosopher and theologian who specializes in Augustine and Luther, and what we're specifically talking about today is his book, The Meaning of Protestant Theology, which is a bold title, but we are essentially talking about the gospel what it is and how Luther approached this in a way that is both, you know, um, in line with scripture, but has his own unique way. And I think you're really going to enjoy it. I really enjoyed it. It's a favorite topic of mine personally. But before we get into it, I want to let you know uh, that there's a couple people I need to thank. First and foremost, to my patrons, thank you so much for your support. Seriously, that means so, so much to me. Your generous support allows me to continue doing this, and it's such a joy to get to do this. I'm so grateful for you, all of you that support this channel and support me. So if you'd like to be a person in that category who uh, supports this channel, you can go to patreon.com slash gospel simplicity or go to gospel simplicity.com to donate. You can also make one-time donations there or go to paypal.me slash gospel simplicity if you'd like to support. I'd also like to thank my sponsor for today, Kindred. Kindred is a ministry that exists to help people reclaim sacred time with God in their daily lives. And they do this by making these beautiful, stunning Bibles, complete with these full-page photos and beautiful text layouts that will cause you to read the Bible differently than if you're just reading it in a standard Bible. You'll slow down, you'll read more contemplatively, and I think you'll really get a lot out of it. And so if you want to check them out, you can go to kindredapostle.com and use the promo code GOSPEL10 for 10% off your order today. Well, with all that being said, here's the interview. Today, I'm joined by Dr. Philip Carey. Dr. Philip Carey is an American philosopher who serves as a professor at Eastern University with a concentration on Augustine of Hippo. He received his Doctor of Philosophy degree from Yale University under Nicholas Wolterstorff, and he, whose name I kind of butchered. And he has written a number of books, including Good News for Anxious Christians, 10 Practical Things You Don't Have to Do, and a commentary on Jonah, in addition to the book we'll be discussing today, The Meaning of Protestant Theology. Additionally, he has provided lectures on the history of Christian theology, as well as on major figures of history of the history of theology for the teaching company. Dr. Carey, thank you so much for being here today. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. It is absolutely uh, my pleasure to have you. And I would like to start with, you write this book called The Meaning of Protestant Theology, and you start it by talking about ecumenical dialogue and what you think Protestantism has to offer. I'd love to know, how did you get interested in participating in these conversations, and why do you think they matter? Well, right. Um, it started in graduate school because uh, one of the people I studied with, in addition to Nicholas Walterstorff, is George Lindbeck, who is a, a, a blessed memory, a wonderful man, a wonderful theologian, and he's been, he was involved in ecumenical dialogue between Lutherans and Catholics for, for his whole uh, adult life. And he taught me something about how important it is to see the, the Christian tradition whole, um, whole, but also divided. And the division isn't right, right? We should not stay divided. We should be talking to each other and we should be learning from each other and appreciating the gift that other Christian communions are to our communion. Protestants need to learn from Catholics. Catholics need to learn from Protestants. Um, and that sort of became part of my DNA as a scholar because of, of studying with George Lindbeck. That's wonderful. And I think that kind of 
ethos will fit really well with my audience who which is very diverse and many people trying to make sense of the divisions that exist and also the unity and how all of that uh, happens. And I'm really excited to have you today talking about kind of a Protestant view of the gospel, which I think is something that you communicate so well in your book. But you, you titled, yeah, you're welcome. You titled the book, The Meaning of Protestant Theology, which is a pretty grand title. And you offer a bit of a interpretive subtitle in Luther, Augustine, and The Gospel That Gives Us Christ. Right. What is it that you think comes to mind for most people when they think about the meaning of Protestant theology? And in what ways it, does your proposal in this book kind of differ from that? Okay, this is interesting. Yes, um, um, one thing to know about book titles is that they almost always nowadays are given by the publisher rather than by the author. So this title was not my title. I tried to live up to it. Um, and it actually was good for me, I think, to try to live up to the title, although I'm not sure it's the best description of the book. The best description of the book is there in the subtitle, um, which is to say the gospel that gives us Christ. That's, in my view, is at the heart of, of Protestant theology. Um, which, of course, isn't what most people think about when they think about Protestant theology these days. Um, I, I guess what most people think of is, is you know, not Catholic, not Orthodox, um, uh, ordinary, you know, like, like this is America. So, you know, in America, everybody's a Protestant, including the Catholics, um, uh, including the Jews sometimes seem to be more Protestant than Jewish. Um, and certainly a whole lot of American Catholics uh, want to be Protestants and kind of resent their own church for not being Protestant. Um, but then lots of Protestants end up turning Catholic when they become theologically serious. So one of the things that gets me interested and involved in ecumenical discussion is that so many of my own students and friends and colleagues have, um, well, have grew up evangelical, got bitten by the liturgy bug. Uh, it, it, you probably know what, what I'm talking about, right? You, you, once you have encountered the Christian, the ancient Christian liturgies, you can't go back. Um, you, you, you have to be part of a liturgical church. So, so they become Episcopalians and then they get fed up with the Episcopal church and they become Catholic or Orthodox. It's, it's a trajectory that colleagues, friends, and students have, have all taken. And, uh, you know, I have to think about that because I, I, I'm one of the people who introduces them to the great tradition. I introduce my students and my friends to, to Augustine. I'm reading Aquinas with a Protestant theologian who's going to convert to the Catholic Church next year. Um, so, so I have to think about that because so many people are on the move in this, this, this particular theological trajectory. I'm not, but I like reading Augustine, and I think Protestants should read Aquinas. And I don't think it's a, a tragedy when Protestants become Catholic, but it would be a tragedy if we didn't have Protestants. Um, we don't, by the way, we don't have to have Protestants di divided from Catholics. That's a sin, right? We don't have to have sin. Um, the divisions in the church are a sin, um, but I think there's something that Protestants bring to the table of, of, of the, the life of the church that is needed. And so it would be a tragedy if, if people didn't have the, the, the theological gift that, that Protestantism has to bring. That's really well said. Something that really excited me about doing this interview particularly is I also come across lots of people who once they become more theologically inclined, once they get bitten by that liturgy bug, and I see it at Moody mm -hmm. where I go to school, and uh, many of the people who uh, follow this channel are people who have converted to Catholicism or Orthodoxy who were formerly Protestants. And what I think sometimes unfortunate in those stories, and I'm with you, I, I have no problem with that happening, but what I think is unfortunate is when maybe like the worst of Protestantism is compared to the best of Catholicism and it becomes, well, there's just so much more depth here and there's not really much digging into, and this certainly isn't true of all people, but what is like the best of Protestant theology? And for me, I happen to think that the best of Protestant theology is really this idea of union with Christ. And mm -hmm. that was something that it was a professor of mine that taught me that, and I remember him pulling up your book one day in class saying, you should huh. read this, and so here we are. But, huh. yeah. Um, one thing that I think is also interesting, when we talk about what Protestants are known for, you didn't mention this, but I imagine you would agree that, at least historically, something that is central to Protestantism is this idea of justification. Like, that's like the $10 theological word you first learn when you start getting into Protestant theology is justification, and we know we care about it, we know it's important. We might not have a great grasp of what exactly it means, but we know we care about it. 
But yeah. you write in the introduction to your book that making the gospel central actually mm. decenters the doctrine of justification by faith alone, precisely by locating its center in Christ, not in our faith or our justification. I really liked this distinction you were making between the gospel and justification, because I think for many Protestants, that's going to be confusing. Like, isn't right. justification the gospel and the gospel is justification? Why would you make that distinction? Could you speak a bit to that? And maybe in so doing, what do you mean by gospel? Right. Okay. Yeah. So that's that gets into the heart of what the book is about. Right. Um, interestingly, most Protestants that I know of no longer talk about justification. It's, it's what you learn as soon as you start doing a, a course in Protestant theology, because you know, it's what Luther and Calvin talk about. But you know, Augustine talked about it too, long before Protestantism, um, but it wasn't nearly as central, right? It really is a, a very central doctrine for Luther and Calvin. But the, the word justification has practically dropped out of most ordinary Protestants' vocabulary. Um, and if you were to, now, now imagine you're a seminary student or you know a, a student taking your first course in, in theology. Well, what, what's Protestantism associated with? It's justification by faith alone, right? Now, strikingly, um, less than half of the Protestants I saw in a recent poll believe in justification by faith alone. They don't actually, it's, it's not actually a, a Protestant belief anymore, even though it's, it's historically, of course, absolutely central to Protestantism. It's, it's one of the things that, that Protestants died for. Okay. And yet I'm saying, let's decenter it. Well, in a relative way, um, justification is still important, but I don't think justification is the center of Christian faith. Christ is which is why the gospel is. And justification is like a, a description of what the gospel does. It's not, just, justification is not the heart of Christian faith. It's a description of what the heart of Christian faith does. Because the heart of his Christian faith is Christ given to us through his word and Christ through his word enters our hearts and changes everything. And justification is the description at a rather abstract level of what that does. So justification is important but um, if you make it central, then what you end up doing is trying to give people advice about how to be justified or even worse, how to be saved. Um, and once you do that, then you're, you're not preaching the gospel anymore because the gospel is not telling you how to be saved. The gospel is telling you how Christ saves you. And that gets to the heart of the book. Um, the gospel is, as Luther defines it, and I think he's, he's, I think he's just right about this. The gospel is, is the story about who Jesus is. It's the story told by the prophets and apostles about who Jesus is. You can tell other stories that are that don't quite get, get it right. But when you're telling the same story as the prophets and the apostles about who Jesus is and what he does for our salvation, then, then that's the gospel. Um, so notice it's a story about what Jesus does or what God does in Christ. You can also tell the gospel by telling about the Father and the Holy Spirit and the Son, right? This is a Trinitarian story. Uh, but at the center of it is the incarnation of God in Christ. And um, that's a story about what God does. And the fundamental contrast that Luther is so intent on, more important to him than justification itself, is this famous distinction between law and gospel. And the law, the law of God, is God telling us what to do. And the gospel is God telling us what God does in Christ through the Holy Spirit for us and for our salvation. So anyone telling you what to do is at best giving you the law, uh, but they can't be giving you the gospel, right? Nothing that tells you what to do is the gospel because the gospel is not telling you what you do. It's telling you what Christ does. And it's also um, at the center of it, it's a, it's a story about Christ. And at the center of it is the promise of Christ. So there, it's, it's a story in which at the heart of it, Jesus is making promises to us that he is still in the process of keeping like, Lo, I will be with you always, even to the end of the age. That's a promise that's still being kept and will be kept until the end of the age. Um, or this is my body given for you. right? And that promise kept on, keeps on being made and kept over and over and over again. Um, so that promise is at the heart of the gospel, which is uh, at the, how the gospel gives us Christ. And that's, um, well, that, that's, I think, part of what we'll be talking about as we, as we move forward is how the gospel gives us Christ. But to begin with, it, it, it gives us Christ by telling us who he is and what he does, rather than by telling us what we have to do 
even what we have to do be, do to be saved. That, no, 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 no. The lost sheep doesn't do anything to get found. The good shepherd finds the lost sheep. And the gospel is the story about the good shepherd finding his lost sheep. Really well said. And that distinction of law and gospel, though it was so important to Luther and yeah. I mean, like central to him, is something that really hasn't come down to many of his theological heirs, if you will, perhaps yeah. in the specifically Lutheran tradition. But across Protestantism, I don't see it being talked about a lot. And I think you highlight it really well in your book. And I love what you did there. And for those that are interested, it sounds like your book, um, Good news for anxious Christians kind of gets into some of that with the things they don't have to do. So if they want to check that out, I'll put a link yeah. to that. Um, but you're right. I do want to get more into how the gospel gives us Christ. And you met, you mentioned first about it telling us, and you have a big place in your theology for word and communication. Yeah. Um, but can you delve a bit more into what does it mean for the gospel to give us Christ? Like, is, is that a right. transaction we're given? How... How do we receive right. Christ, and what does it mean to have Christ in that way? Right. Yes, so one of the nicest things about uh, evangelical Protestantism is that they do have this phrase, accepting Christ, right, which is what faith does, right? Faith accepts Christ by believing that the gospel is true. Uh, and, and really, all Christian faith has to do is believe that the gospel is true. Um, and why does that give us Christ? Well, because... The way a person gives themselves to another person is, I, I think, fundamentally through words, by making promises. And the key example, for example, well, the key example is, is a wedding vow, right? You make a promise and you exchange promises, and that's what makes you married. The fact that you love each other doesn't make you married. You have to have, have the promises, and, and then you, 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 the way you receive the promise is simply by believing it. Um, and this is a, a point that Luther makes over and over again. Right? Right? You, how do you receive the gospel? Simply by believing it's true. And that's what he means by justification by faith alone. Right? You don't receive the gospel by doing something about it. You don't even receive the gospel by making a decision. Right? L Luther does not believe in making decisions for Christ. Um, he hates the very notion of free will, it turns out. So he hates the notion that you're going to decide something that's going to save you. Um, because, you know, you make decisions and then you unmake them the next day. Um, we do this all the time, by the way, we Christians, right? We accept Christ and then we turn around and sin, which is a way of not accepting Christ. So, so which are we really? Are we the persons who accept Christ or the persons who don't? Uh, Luther says we're both. Uh, we're, we're justified and sinners at the same time. We're justified by faith. We're sinners because of our unbelief. So, you know, what can we do to save ourselves? And Luther's answer is nothing at all. Uh, you, you're going to have to believe that Christ saves you. You know, you lost sheep, you're going to have to believe in the good shepherd. Um, so the gospel gives you this person, Jesus, the same way that persons ordinarily give themselves to each other. It's by promises, by covenants. Uh, and the deepest way we give ourselves to each other, uh, I think, is by the promises we make. Um, it, it's how we make ourselves known to someone by saying something like, um, I'll always be there for you. Right? Um, now, that's a promise, and it's going to be hard to keep. You know, we, we say that, but but oftentimes, you know, people don't carry out that promise. But imagine someone actually keeping that promise. Then you know something about who they are and what they will be for you. Uh, and, and wedding vows are like that. And um, and so is, well, God's wedding vow. Uh, you know, the theologians call it the covenant. When, when God says in, in the Old Testament at numerous points and, and all the way to the book of Revelation, uh, you will be my people. I will be your God. That's God saying who God is and when, who Israel is and who we are when we are you know, in, in, in grafted into Israel by faith. So that's, that's who we are. And, and the promise gives us who God is and, and, and makes us into God's people the way a wedding vow makes a man and a woman into husband and wife. Um, so that's why the gospel, I think, gives us Christ and is so central to Christian faith. What faith does is it, it takes hold of this, this word and says, ah, I am my beloved's and he is mine because he promised. Not because I love him enough. I, I don't love my savior enough, um, but because he loved me and he promised and he keeps his word and I can count on him keeping his word. And that way 
uh, I don't have to depend on the strength of my decision or whether I've really given my heart to Christ, which sometimes I have and sometimes I haven't, right? I can depend on God's promise, which is a whole lot better and a whole, more, a whole lot more reliable than any decision I make. Yes, that, that's good and that, that's helpful. I, I'd like to maybe ask a clarifying question here. Sure. Um, when we talk about words, like you mentioned that the vows make people married or the gospel being uh, essentially not only God's word, but it's there's that promise associated with it too. So that's maybe what distinguishes his words in a bit from our words. Um, mm-hmm. It's not only revealing, but it's a promise that it's going to stay that way. And, and I'm, I, I could be getting off here a bit, but I'd be curious, is there... Are the words doing something? Mm. Is there like a a function of them? Because I think for a lot of people, if they're thinking about wedding vows, perhaps, they have this notion of, and maybe it's not the best use of this word either, which is a conversation for another day, but of like kind of just a a symbolic thing of, Mm. um, you know, we say these words, but the words, they're not doing something. It's kind of just like a a declaration. I know this is technical. um, Right, right. But could you speak a bit on that? What... Because I think if we're going to talk about the gospel in terms of words, I think this might be an important distinction here. Hey, we'll be right back to the interview. But first, I want to tell you about another sponsor for today, and that is Faithful Counseling. Faithful Counseling is a group of Christian counselors that exist to help you get the help you need. You know, one of the first YouTube videos I ever made was called You Can Have Jesus and a Therapist Too. And what I wanted to do in that video was draw out the fact that so many people are struggling with mental health. And the last thing we want to do is make it more difficult for people to reach out to get the help they need by creating this stigma around it. It's something that I'm really passionate about and think we need to end in Christian circles. And that's why I'm so excited to be partnering with Faithful Counseling. They're counselors all will be counseling from a Christian perspective and you can connect with them from any country in the world. They have counselors that speak many different languages and hey if it's important to you to have a counselor from your specific tradition or background they can do their part to try to pair you up with one of them as well. All of their counselors are licensed with over 3,000 hours of experience. You can connect with these counselors in a variety of ways. Four in fact. You can do video sessions, phone calls, live chat, or messaging. All of the messaging is secure. If it's between scheduled sessions, you'll receive a response within 24 to 48 hours. If this is interesting to you, if you think this would be helpful for you or maybe a loved one, I'd encourage you to go to faithfulcounseling.com slash gospel simplicity. If you do that, first of all, you'll get 10% off your order and you'll be matched with a counselor in less than 24 hours hours. Again, that's faithfulcounseling.com slash gospel simplicity to be matched with a counselor in less than 24 hours and get 10% off your first month. Faithful counseling costs $260 per month, which gets you unlimited messaging with your counselor and four 30 minute sessions. But again, if you go to faithfulcounseling.com slash gospel simplicity, you'll get 10% off that first month. Lastly, faithful counseling is not a crisis line. If you are currently experiencing suicidal thoughts or ideation, please reach out to a crisis line or hotline. You can find one of them at www.crisistextline.org. Please do so and reach out. You do not have to do this alone. Well, thank you all so much, and I will let you get back to the video. But if you want to check them out, again, faithfulcounseling.com slash gospel simplicity. The link is in my bio and in the pinned comment. Well, back to the interview. Right. So in general, uh, there are lots of words that do something. Uh, promises bind you, for instance, right? You make a promise and and you are, and if you're an honest person, your word is your bond. And suddenly, you, you know, you committed yourself through your words and weddings are, uh, wedding vows are an example. Um, but there's lots of other examples, like um, when you name somebody, right? You name your child, right? Um, when you baptize somebody, um, when you when you give someone a name, that's a, a verbal transaction. Um, or, or <laughs> one example that, that's that's often used by philosophers is when you um, when you name a ship, right? You take a bottle of champagne, cr- crash it against the bow of the ship, it, it slides into the ocean, and you've named the ship, you know, whatever the the HMS uh, Queen Elizabeth II, right? Um, and and that's the name of the thing, and you say, I hereby name this ship Blong, right? And, and that's that's the name of the thing. So you've just done something. You've given this ship a name by by what you've done with your words. And um, with with marriage, you've done something. You've made yourself a husband and a wife by your by your words. 
Um, uh, yes, I remember once um, when my son and I were, were, were at odds with each other when he was a little guy and, and um, you know, he was mad at me and I was not particularly happy with him, but it, the resolution was when I said to him, you are my beloved son, right? And that I think is, is, is a promise. When, when the, the deep way we say, I, I love you really means I am yours, you are mine, right? Uh, we belong to each other and that's a promise. Um, and that does something that changed our, well, in that case, I hope it, it renewed and restored our relationship. It didn't create it, but God has words that create relationships. And you know, marriage I think is, is a crucial example, but friendships happen that way too. People wanna to say, I'll always be there for you. I'm your, I'm your best friend, right? When, when someone says I'm your best friend, that's not just a description. It's not just an expression of how they feel, it's a promise. So words do things all the time. And then um, the wonderful piece of background information um, here is that um, by the time you get to Luther and the 16th century, um, the Christian tradition in the West has been thinking of words as signs, right? The, the word that gets used is signum in Latin, which is sign. It's, it's not exactly the same as symbol, although interestingly, John Calvin, I think, uses sign and symbol interchangeably. Um, but the crucial notion about these signs, by the time you get to the 16th century, everybody in the church uh, agrees these signs do something. They don't just signify uh, something, uh, but the sacramental signs, right, in the Eucharist and baptism, uh, they don't just signify something, they give what they signify. That's, a, that's Catholic sacramental theology, official Catholic sacramental theology ever since about the 12th century. Um, sacraments are outward invisible signs of an invisible um, uh, and inner grace is one definition, but they're not just signs of this grace, they give you that grace when properly received. So Luther, when he, when he works out the notion of the gospel early in his career as a theologian, he thinks of it as a means of grace a sign, because words are signs in this uh, tradition that goes back to St. Augustine. Words are, are one kind of sign. And Luther thinks that the gospel word is a sign that gives you what it signifies. And what does this gospel word signify? It signifies Jesus Christ. So just like a sacrament, uh, Luther firmly believes that the sacrament of the Eucharist, for instance, gives us Christ's body and blood. He very firmly believes that. And the, the gospel does something very similar. It gives us Christ in person so that we can be united with him by faith. Um, and and we're, when we're united with him by faith, we're united with him, body, soul, and divinity. The whole Christ belongs to us and is united to us and, and dwells in our hearts. Well, yeah, even the body in a, in a certain way. Um, and that's what the word does. It signifies Christ because it's it, we're all, words, all words are a kind of sign. But some words can give what they signify. Some words have the power to do that. And the gospel word emphatically has the same kind of power as a sacrament. It, it's a sign that gives what it signifies to those who believe. You know, there's a part in your book where I think it's an appendix where you it's Luther's, I think it's a Christmas Day sermon. He's talking about oh, yeah. the gospel as a sacrament. And it really brings that home. And I had never come across that writing from Luther and really really enjoyed it. But I think that's going to be really helpful for people because I think a lot of the people that are listening to this too will have kind of that sacramental background. And so being yeah. able to hear a word as not what we might talk of today as like a bear sign, but as right. a, a sign that, uh, well, Calvin's language would be like seals that which it signifies, but right. gives uh, what it what it signs, I think is going to be helpful for people. Now, this, yeah, is going yeah. to get, this is going to get a little in the weeds here, but I think my audience can handle it, and I, I promise we'll zoom back out a little bit after this. But I found this intriguing, and I think people will as well. In your book, you contrast Luther's vision of union with Christ with Augustine's more platonic view of the beatific vision. I know, like I said, this, this might be technical, but bear with us. I, I think it's worthwhile to understand the philosophical underpinnings of these views, which you devote a lot of time to in your book. Could you speak a bit to the way that this divide comes about and how Platonism influences Augustine and what kind of Luther is reacting to here? Or reacting right. may make it sound negative, but giving like a different view of? Right. I, I think Luther is, is kind of supplementing something in Augustine that Augustine is missing. 
uh, Luther loves Augustine and, and you know, nine tenths of the time Luther wants to be on the same page as Augustine, but he thinks Augustine's missing something. Uh, and what he's missing is the power of the word. Um, because the word is, uh, the, the, the gospel word is an external word, right? It comes out of our mouths, it's, it's in the sound waves, it gets into our ears, and that's how Christ gets into our heart, is through an external oral word, says Luther. And uh, Augustine doesn't quite think that way. And that's because he has um, imbibed so much of ancient Platonism. Now, ancient Platonism, of course, is the philosophy that goes back to Plato, um, who's living um, you know, 300 years before Christ. He does, never heard of Jesus. Um, and Platonism and Christianity have been intertwined since the Apostle Paul started using some Platonist language when he says the things that are seen are temporal, the things that are unseen are eternal. That, that's almost a summary of part of Plato. Uh, but then Paul goes to talk about Jesus as if Jesus is the eternal thing that we're not seeing, right? Which, you know, that's not Plato. Um, so Christianity and Plato have been intertwined for, for, for almost from the beginning, right? Augustine is much more Platonist than Paul is. Um, and why? Well, two things. There's one that's fairly obvious and one that's more in the weeds. The obvious thing is that Plato makes a big deal about the difference between soul and body. Right. And if, if you want if you want to believe that your soul goes to heaven when you die, you're not going to see that picture in the Bible. Right. It's, it's not a picture you see in the New Testament. It's in Plato. Plato believes in the immortality of the soul. That phrase, immortality of the soul, is from Plato. It is not. You won't find that that, that, word, that phrase in the Bible. Right? It's not a biblical phrase. The biblical phrase is resurrection of the dead or life everlasting. But there's this notion of the soul that gets separated from the body when you die and then goes to heaven when you die. You'll find that in Plato, not in, not in the Bible. Now, lots of Christians like that picture and for good reason, right? What's, what's happening to us before, we, before we're raised from the dead at the end of, of, of time or the last day? Well, Plato's picture might help us with that. right? And then you have people like Dante who have this whole elaborate picture of souls disembodied, uh, living in hell, purgatory and heaven. Um, you couldn't have that picture without Plato, right? So Plato has been important for Christians for a long time, but then there's something subtler and deeper, and that's the notion of intellect. Plato has the notion that what makes us immortal in our souls is that, uh, unlike the souls of animals, uh -huh, footnote, of course animals have souls. Everybody in the ancient world believed animals had souls. Right. The Bible says animals have souls, right? The, only modern people are, 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 have this notion that animals don't have souls, right? What animals don't have is rational or intellectual souls, right? They can't do mathematics. They can't balance a checkbook. They can't write poetry. They can't get involved in, in, in disputes about elections, right? Um, that's, that all requires intellect. And at the heart of the rational soul of human beings is this intellect that is really a kind of vision, right? Think of it as intellectual vision. And you know what it's like. You don't. You may not know the label, but, but you've had this experience. Think about what happens in, say, a math class. You're listening to a, a lecture, and you're not quite getting it, right? You're trying to figure it out. Um, now, you, you, when you do that, you're doing something that a dog and a cat never does, trying to figure out mathematics. The word for that in the ancient world is, is ratio or reason or logos, right? biblical word. Um, discursive reason, it's called, because you're discoursing, you're talking to each to yourself, you're trying to figure stuff out. Then imagine what happens, or remember what happened, when you got it. Instead of figuring it out, suddenly you see it. You say, aha, now I see it. I get it. I see it. That's intellect. That's intellect in action. That, that moment of vision um, imagine it's, say, the Pythagorean theorem that you're thinking about, right? So it's about a triangle and, and the angles in a triangle. But the triangle you're seeing when you say, aha, now I see it, is not a triangle that's drawn in chalk on a chalkboard or on a whiteboard or, or on a screen. It's, it's, well, when did that triangle begin to exist? When will it cease to exist? When will the Pythagorean theorem cease to be true? When did it begin to be true? You see, in fact, these mathematical truths are... Wow, eternal, without beginning, without end, right? Uh, there's something what, spiritual about them, right? Um, well, the, the, the view that developed in the Platonist tradition after Plato is that these truths, uh, not just mathematics, but truths about um, 
what is the true and the good and the beautiful, truths about what is courage and justice and wisdom. Th these truths um, are eternal and our souls have this intellectual capacity to see them. And that's what we want. More than anything else, we want to see the light of truth, capital T, right? And if you think that's a name for God, well, yes, yeah, so does Augustine, right? Um, and there's the good, capital G, the supreme good, the highest good, the truth that, well, I mean, okay. I think this is what Augustine's thinking here. Imagine that you have this aha moment and you're seeing the truth, but not just one little mathematical truth like the Pythagorean theorem. Imagine you're seeing the truth that contains every truth there is, right? The great, it, the eternal mind that contains all truths, right? Imagine that's the aha moment, right? I think that's what Augustine means by beatific vision, right? Aha! And what you're seeing is the eternal truth of all things. You're seeing the mind of God. And that's the beatific vision that, that, that Augustine talks about, Aquinas talks about. It's really very central to the Roman Catholic tradition. Um, it, you can see it's a, it's a deep notion, right? And this may be true about us, but the Bible doesn't require us to believe this, right? And Augustine did believe, and so did Aquinas. And I think to be a good Catholic, you really have to believe something like that. To be a Protestant, you don't actually have to believe that. And Luther didn't. Um, and the reason why is that um, this moment of vision, this intellectual vision, well, it, it, it's a great way of thinking about mathematics and the fundamental principles of being. It's not a great way of thinking about persons, right? Aha, I see it is not exactly how you see persons, right? Sometimes we have insights about persons that are a little bit like that. But um, what we do with persons, I think, and, and I've been instructed by Luther in this way, but I think I've been instructed by the Bible this way. What we do with persons is we hear them because a person has the authority to speak for themselves, right? You can't just look at a person and know who they are. They have a say about who they are, right? So that's why I think words are essential to our knowledge of other persons. Other persons have a right to a say so about who they are. One of the forms of oppression that we should not engage in is sort of uh, looking at people and thinking we know who they are, right? They have a right to a say so about who they are. That's true about every person that, that exists. Um, children are not so good at it, but their parents will listen to them anyways, right? And by their listening to their children, they teach their children how to become themselves, right? There's a kind of listening that helps people become themselves. But grown-ups, they have an authority to speak for themselves. Uh, and they can choose to lie and not, and not give themselves to be known. But when a faithful person makes a promise and keeps it, they can give themselves to be known. And you can't just sort of get around it and say, oh, I can see through what you're saying and get to your heart. That's how you know a, a, someone is lying, right? I see what's behind your words, right? With a faithful person, the way you know them is, is let their word into your heart and receive their word and say, ah, so you're telling me who you are. That's who you are. You're, you're the person who made that promise, right? Or you know, you're the Lord God of Israel who brought Israel out of bondage, out of the house of bondage, and you want us to worship no God but you. That's who you are. Oh, now I get it, right? Uh, but you get it by hearing it. Um, so here's a, a kind of thumbnail summary of the, of the difference. With this notion of vision, you're seeing it for yourself, right? Um, you, you're no longer, once you see it, once you get it, you don't need your math teacher anymore. You've seen it yourself, right? You can leave the math teacher behind. Grateful maybe, yes, but you no longer need the teacher. But when it comes to knowing another person, you never get around their word, right? You can see that they're keeping their word, but you, you, you never sort of outgrow the word when it comes to other persons. And it's, it's kind of secondhand, right? Instead of seeing for yourself, you're dependent on what the other person says about who they are. And that dependence on the other person seems to me to be essential to knowledge of the other person. You know the other person precisely because you're dependent on their say-so, right? Mathematics isn't like that, but people are. And knowing God is like that too, right? To know God, we're dependent on what God has to say about himself. Um, and that dependence is not a bad thing. This is essential to, to how people have an authority to, to, to speak for themselves. And certainly God does.
So hearing is kind of secondhand, seeing is kind of firsthand, right? Seeing is like, I see it for myself. Hearing is like, I'm, I depend on the word of the other. Hearing is the way we know other person is because it makes us dependent on the people we know. So in a way here, what I'm, I think you said, um, or how did you say it? Well, I'll just put it this way. The beatific vision is giving a bit more of a vision, uh, vision of kind of like this direct access yes. without kind of this intermediary of the God who is revealing himself, but rather just full direct access. Whereas what Luther's kind of maybe adding on or pushing back to with is saying, hey, we still need God revealing himself. And we have that through word, through hearing who right. he is. For, is that fair? That's fair. Yes. Um, one la one bit of language that people may, might be familiar with is is the notion of beatific vision is is a notion of immediacy. You, you called it direct, right? Now, immediate means no mediation, right? And, and mediation is is the notion of something in the middle, something in between. The notion of beatific vision is there's nothing between me and what I'm seeing, um, and the uh, the truth that I'm seeing is it's kind of directly present. Well, with people, what's directly present is their bodies, right? And what makes them known is the mediation of the word, right? Again, because people have the authority to speak for themselves. So the, the crucial notion here, I think, is not so much revelation as authority. Um, and authority is fascinatingly, is, is in, in, the, in the tradition that goes back to St. Augustine, is not, uh, authority is not a quality of rulers and, and leaders. Authority is a quality of teachers. Right? We talk about someone being an authority on her subject. That's the kind of authority that, that Augustine's thinking about. Um, even the word master originally meant schoolmaster, teacher. Uh, it's, it's come from a, a Latin word meaning teacher. So teachers have authority. Why? Because they know something. But suppose what we want to know is not mathematics, uh, upon which you know some math teachers are, are, are authorities, but suppose we want to know a person. Well, the, the authority of the, uh, uh, on that person is, is themselves, right? They have the authority to say who they are. And any form of knowledge that doesn't respect that authority is disrespecting the person, right? We have to respect the authority of the, of the person to speak for themselves. And I think that's, that's absolutely the case with God, um, you know, not just because God is a person, but because God is, is incomprehensibly beyond our capacity for knowledge, but also God is kind enough to become a human person and give himself to be known in the in the, the flesh of a human person and the word that's about that human person and, and, and thus to make himself known the way persons make themselves known. And that's through a word that, that is mediated, that is heard, that is secondhand rather than this immediacy of vision. Yeah. That's fantastic. Thank you. And if people are into philosophy and understanding kind of the philosophical underpinnings of different ideas, there is a lot of that in this book and so they should definitely check that out if they want to see more of that than we can cover here but i want to zoom back out a little bit and get back to this idea of hearing and it's it's pinned all throughout the work which i think is really yeah. fascinating and shows just like a, a clarity of thought on this but you you emphasize this hearing of the word and i could imagine some people saying wondering like is there a, a tangible difference between say hearing the gospel and thinking about the gospel, studying the gospel. Are those, are those things different or is there something, why is it that hearing the gospel is so central? Right. Um, part of it is, is that importance that it's secondhand, it's dependent on the word of the other. So, you know, you, you can be a good Christian and be deaf and, and literally unable to hear. Right. Um, but hearing is, is Sometimes it's a metaphor for this secondhand thing, right? I have to believe what I'm, what I hear, right? Even a deaf person can sometimes say it. I, what I've heard is, right? You, uh, you can imagine a deaf person speaking that way. Um, but hearing is also uh, important because there's a way in which it forms us that's distinctive to how hearing works, um, and it's, it, this is why hearing music is different from just having an idea about the music. So. Um, Let's switch from Plato to Aristotle. <laughs> uh, Aristotle and Plato both talk about form, but Aristotle thinks that you find the form of things in the physical things themselves. So think about the form of, of your favorite song, right? Now, you, you, we know what that looks like. <laughs> looks like. We know what that, 
it, it's 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 information that can be printed on a CD or uh, on a hard drive. It can be broadcast uh, on on radio, and it, it can be in sound waves. All of those have the same form, but different material, right? And that form is what gets into your ears, and then in in the Bible, there's this deep connection between ear and heart, right? Um, in the Bible, the heart is not just how you feel, but also how you think, right? You think in your heart if you're Hebrew or, you know, Jesus knows the thoughts that are in the Pharisees' hearts, right? So heart is a word for mind in, in the Bible. So the word gets into your ears, into your heart, but in the heart, it's the same form as on the CD, uh, in the hard drive, in the radio waves. And, and what proves it is that you can sing it, right? If, if you have your, your favorite song in your heart, you can sing it just like your your you know, your stereo can, can play the, the, the form of the music. Um, and think about the difference between that and having an idea about the music, right? You can have an idea about Beethoven's Fifth Symphony if you even if you've never heard it, because you might have read something about it. But hearing it is different, right? And and having the form of it in your heart or learning it by heart if you're a musician, right? Da 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 Think of, of a musician who's learned to, to, to play in the orchestra and learned to play Beethoven, right? They have a differently shaped heart than, than someone who doesn't know as much music, right? That has changed who they are, right? They're, they're a different kind of person. They're a musician, right? Well, someone who has the gospel in their heart uh, and believes it is a different kind of person. We call them a Christian, right? Uh, and that makes a difference in who they are, how they live, what they do. Just like being a musician makes a huge difference in how you live, how you hear things, uh, how you understand things, how you perceive things, right? Musicians can hear better than we can, right? Or let me switch, right? Uh, skills are something that form your heart. So imagine you've got a skilled basketball player, right? And, you know, oh, oh let me switch the metaphor again. Fencing. My son is a fencing coach, right? I look at professional fencing and I can't tell what they're doing. My son looks at it and he can see what they're doing. He says, oh, that's a post repost. Right? I think that's one of the things he says, right? He sees it because he knows and understands and his heart has been formed by, by the skill of fencing. So I think what happens with the gospel and what Luther wants us to understand is that our hearts are formed by the gospel so that Christ dwells in our hearts by faith. The, we, are, we are formed in the image of Christ and we perceive the world differently, we move to the world differently, we act in the world differently, the same way a musician moves and perceives the world differently than someone who's tone deaf, right? And, and that's how the, the word shapes us and makes us Christians and uh, brings us to Christ. That's wonderful. I think there's a lot of implications to this view of hearing yeah and of what the gospel is in this distinction of law and gospel. Obviously, there's lots of implications to all of these things, but I want to tease out a couple of them okay. because I think they'll be of interest to people, and I also think seeing the implications at times helps people solidify the concept. And so one of the areas you talk about, and this might be more in the law-gospel distinction, um, but it also has to do with hearing, is at the end of your book, you give a lot of steps of, you know, kind of next things um, or... Mm. Uh, kind of like conclusions and where Protestants can go from here. Uh, but you you say that a lot of Protestants who are more dependent on preaching than liturgy, which describes what I grew up in. I grew up in kind of like a mega church style thing where, you know, you heard an inspiring talk each week and you had like a, a action step to do, uh, but it wasn't liturgical in at least the uh, mainstream sense of that word. Uh, you, you say that people in those types of contexts are at a disadvantage to hearing the gospel. Now, I think for a lot of people, they'd be like, how? They give wonderful 30-minute speeches every time, and it's about the gospel. Certainly, I'm yeah. hearing the gospel. 
how does this view that you've presented kind of show that though you may be hearing things about Christ, um, you're at a disadvantage to hear the gospel? Right. Um, right. Um, the disadvantage is that you're at the mercy of the preacher and the not every preacher gets it. Right. Um, my experience with preachers and pastors is that some of them get it and some of them don't. Um, let's go back to a point you made earlier that was really interesting. Um, the, 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 the talk about law and gospel is not very widespread among Protestant churches outside of the Lutheran churches. Lutherans talk about that difference all the time, but most other Protestants don't. But that doesn't mean there's no difference between law and gospel or that you can't detect the difference. Um, I think people can feel it in their gut. Um, if you have a sermon of 30 minutes that's basically giving you a challenging sermon that's uh, telling you what to do to make you into a great Christian uh, and not make the same mistake that Peter made when he denied Christ, you, you can't do that. We've got to be better than the chief of the apostles, right? That's an object lesson what not to do, right? And we can't be a lost sheep because, you know, we're supposed to be found. So all this stuff that we're supposed to do, right? Uh, I still remember so many people talking about challenging sermons, right? Well, a uh, challenging sermon doesn't, isn't the same thing as a kind word from God that gives us Jesus, right? A kind word from, that gives us Jesus from God is, 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 is the gospel. And I have sat through a whole lot of sermons that were very detailed and had lots of things to say and not, not a lot of good advice about how to Christ, give the Christian life, but that's not the gospel, right? The gospel is this kind word, um, Boy, I was just listening to a, um, a radio preacher uh, earlier this afternoon. There's nothing kind about what he was saying. There are people who are hurting and needy. And it's like, I mean, you know what it's like um, if, if you're married or, or have a, have a, a, a dear friend and, and you're, you're having an awful day and you hate yourself and, and you hate the world. And, 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 you know, my wife comes to me and says, you know, I love you. You know, will you believe that for a second? Right. Um, it's like, oh. Right. Let, let me let me believe that, that, that this person wh whom I love loves me and, and that helps put me back together. It's an image of the grace and mercy of God. Um, and I think the liturgies, the ancient liturgies are full of that word. Right. You go to a Greek Orthodox church and, and uh, there's, there's, there's nothing but 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 images of Christ. And uh, from from Genesis one to the rest of the Bible, the, the liturgy sort of takes all this imagery and says, this is a way of talking about Christ. Get it, right? And, and, and then the liturgy does talk about Christ by using this all this uh, poetic imagery throughout the Bible. Um, so if you go to a Greek Orthodox service, you're sure to get the gospel. Um, if you go to any uh, church that has a Eucharistic liturgy, right, where they understand you have to use the words of institution, then you're sure to get the gospel because at the very least you'll hear these words, this is my body given for you. And that's about as pure gospel as you can get. But if you just have a, a, a preaching service, you might just get a pep talk about how to live the Christian life. And that's not the gospel. And um, you know, I've been at churches uh, like that for sometimes for years. And um, in the end, I, I would have to, uh, I, I hate to say this, but I would have to leave because it was like slow poison, right? Um, and I, I would go home and take a nap because I was so depressed. And then I would have to try to figure out what went wrong because I'm a theologian and I try to figure out what, what goes wrong and, and figure out the theology of it. But I think people can feel it in their gut. Um, it's the difference between uh, being given a lot of advice and practical advice about how to live the Christian life, you know, 10 practical things you don't really have to do, but, but you're still given that advice. It's the difference between that and, um, you know, if you haven't lived in a liturgical church, just think about um, why it is that sometimes your heart just goes pit a pat when you, the first time you hear in December, right? Oh, come all ye faithful, joyful and triumphant. You're, you're going to Bethlehem because there's a baby there and he's your savior. Isn't it wonderful? It's December. We're getting, we're ready for Christmas. Yes. Right. Um, it's just joyous good news. Um, that's the, probably the most liturgical that some Protestants ever get is, is Christmas carols. Um, the Christmas carols are all about that baby in the manger. Yes, yes, I, I, I come to bring you tidings, glad tidings of great joy, says the angel. The angel knows how to preach the gospel, right? There, look, go to Bethlehem, there's, that's where the baby is, yes, right? Um, as opposed to, um, yeah, sermons that are basically good advice. Um, or 
The worst is the sermons that tell you this is how to be a good Christian. And, you know, if you're not doing that, well, I have to wonder whether you're really a Christian. Right. Um, that can be um, incredibly wounding. So, yeah, um, you're at the mercy of the preacher um, in Protestant churches uh, if you don't have a good liturgy. So um, that's why getting bitten by the liturgy bug is such an important experience for so many people and why so many people just don't want to go back after they've been bitten by that bug. Yes, saying you're at the mercy of the preacher is a great way of putting it because there's something in the well, the liturgy has that reliability to it, even though you may come across very bad sermons in a liturgical church that's still, <laughs> you know uh, occupational hazard but yeah. there's you know you're going to receive those gospel promises built in each week and you're right. going to hear the gospel in that way you've hit on this a bit and so i don't think it'll take long but again another implication that i think is important for people is this uh so we talked about you know the liturgy generally but the the eucharist obviously this is huge. And uh, yeah. John Williamson Nevin, he has this great quote of any theory of the Eucharist will be found to accord closely with the view that is taken at the same time of the nature of the union generally between Christ and his people. To summarize, you know, what you believe about union with Christ is going to determine what you believe about um, the Eucharist. If you believe that right. it's just, well, I have, um, I don't know, make this like I have this abstract thing where Christ stays over there and I assent to a couple things, then, you know, you're probably going to have a view of the Eucharist where you re it, re retain this gap, per se. Um, or if you have this idea of more bodily union with Christ, that being salvation, the Eucharist is probably going to be a bit more bodily in that way. What view of the Eucharist is kind of entailed by what you've laid out in this book? Right. Um, something like Luther's view is, is probably entailed. And, you know, but, but when Luther looked at, at the Roman Catholic view, he said, well, I'm, they, they've got all the essential stuff. Christ is there in, in, the, in the bread. They think there's no bread there, but, but yeah, they, they do an extra miracle and get rid of bread. But, but Luther thinks that Christ is there in the bread. Catholics think that Christ is there uh, under the appearance of bread. Eh, uh, so what? So long as Christ is there, right? And he's there the way a body is there, because bodies are there whether you believe it or not. And that's absolutely crucial, right? Um, even in John Calvin, who has about the highest sacramental theology of any Protestant other than Luther, you know, your faith has to somehow cross that distance. Now, it does it with the power of the Holy Spirit, says Calvin. Um, but the problem is, you know, suppose you feel like you're, you're weak in faith, right? Your faith is necessary in order to bring, to sort of create that union between you and Christ. Um, Luther is tricky about this. It's really fascinating. Um, right, Christ is present whether you believe it or not. Christ was present for Judas. Christ was present for Pilate, right? So no matter what kind of a sinner you are, Christ is present. You should believe that he's present in grace, right? You have trouble believing that, but I have good news for you. He's present whether you believe it or not, right? That, that's really, really nice, bodily present. Um, it's like... Um, believing that Christ is among us, that this is the, the haha. right. Here's the parallel between God and his people and the Eucharist. The people of God are the body of Christ, right? You walk into a, a congregation of Christians and oftentimes they don't look like the body of Christ, right? You have to just believe that it's true because God promised and that's in the gospel. So you believe it. Well, likewise, why should you think that this you know, wafer of bread and this this cup of, of, of watered down wine is, is the body and blood of Christ. Well, because Christ said so. Why do I believe that Christ is present in my heart? Not because I experience him in my heart. Sometimes I do, sometimes I don't, right? I believe he is present in my heart because he promised, right? So the church is the body of Christ because he promised. The Eucharist is the body of Christ because he promised. Christ dwells in my heart because he promised, right? And in all these cases, my faith is not what makes it happen. My faith receives what Christ has already done. Uh, and that's a, a great, great comfort for all of us who are weak in faith, which I take it is everyone. Yeah, and there is really, Luther is interesting on this topic, but at times there's kind of a, a beautiful simplicity of, what is this? Well, he says, this is my body. Like, what more do you want? This is my, <laughs> and I. This is your body. Yeah, he said so, right. <laughs> Take the words as they, as they appear. Yes, right. I, I do appreciate that about Luther. 
You know, we started this conversation by talking about your interest in ecumenical dialogue and kind of the the outlook of the book of kind of giving um, a, a summary, if you will, of kind of this this stronghold of Protestant theology, the, the meaning of Protestant theology, and that is that it's the gospel that gives us Christ. And we've talked a lot about this. We've talked about the philosophy that distinguishes it from more of a Roman Catholic Augustinian view. We've talked about hearing and words and how these things work and what do they do. If you were to kind of you know, wrap this in a bow for someone in an elevator pitch. You you mentioned that you don't think people need to be Protestant, but we need Protestants. Right. What would you say to someone, maybe to one of your students or maybe to someone listening that's saying, you know, I'm kind of feeling like being Catholic or Orthodox because I, I love the liturgy or I love the history or this or that. What would you say of, here's um, why I think you should perhaps consider staying Protestant. Right. Yeah. I, I, I can see that coming a mile away. I mean, I see students on that trajectory and, and I have, a, I'm beginning to get a sense of when there's a point of no return on that trajectory. Um, we need Protestants because we need an active piety of the word. Protestants more than Catholics and Eastern Orthodox have a piety of the external word, or at least some of them do. Um, they have practices like intensive Bible studies, right? Um, Protestants sort of pioneered the Bible study as a, as a form of devotion. This is good for people. Now, Catholics can do it too, and Orthodox can do it too, but they learned it from Protestants, right? So we need we need Protestants to be doing that. Um, uh, I do think that the focus on the gospel gets at what is really most central to the Christian faith, and always has been. It's it's not some some in you know innovation, right? Christians have always been listening to the gospel and believing it, and um, the it, it's, a, it's a means of grace, and it's a means of grace that without which the other means of grace don't even make sense, right? There's no Eucharist, there's no baptism without the gospel. There's no icons that mean anything in Eastern Orthodoxy if you don't know the story of the gospel, right? Can't mean anything. So we need a piety of the word to understand what's at the very uh, foundation of God giving us Christ. And it really helps having Protestants uh, to do that. Um, yeah, it, it really helps if, if, uh, elevator pitch, here's the elevator pitch. The Christian tradition has Catholics, Orthodox, and Protestants. Each one has something that the other one doesn't have because we have a divided Christendom, a divided church, and that's a sin. It's our fault and only the Holy Spirit can fix it. But meanwhile, in the divided church, every other tradition has something that my tradition needs. And Catholics, I mean, Protestants need Catholic and Orthodox. They do. But Catholics and Orthodox need Protestants. So if you can hang in there as a Protestant um, and develop that piety of the word, then do so because it's needed and, and the body of Christ needs it. I think that's really well said. I want you to give one final piece of advice to a very similar group of people, but they're slightly different because I uh -huh. encounter a lot of these people as well. They are Protestants and they intend to stay Protestant. And because they love things like this, they, they love the, you know, Protestant view of union with Christ or the gospel or, you know, the piety of the word, but they're just not finding these things or like a lot of the things we talked about today mm -hmm. in their church that, that hasn't yeah. been their experience. They read Luther, they read Calvin and they think, yes, they go to church on Sunday and they think, eh. uh, <laughs> what advice would you give to those people? Oh yeah. I, I, I've been one of those people. Um, yeah. Um, the hard thing about this, I think, is that um, you either get it or you don't. Um, my experience with uh, especially pastors, some pastors get it and some of them don't. Um, and, right. And, and, and you, you don't it doesn't work to argue people into this. Um, pardon me. Um, you have to um, you have to notice what's happening in your gut when a certain way of preaching cheers you up and, and builds you up in the faith and other ways of preaching make you depressed. Um, and I don't know how that works other than it does help to have the explicit language of law and gospel. Um, so I, I now am, am part of a church where um, they preach the gospel all the time, but they're, they're Episcopalians. So they don't actually, they haven't actually heard the law gospel distinction, right? But, the, 
but they, they know that, the, that their preaching should be about Christ and should give Christ to people, right? So you don't have to have the language of law and gospel in order to get the difference and, and to convey the difference in how you preach and teach and sing. Um, and so I think that the encouraging thing is, is that difference is real. People feel it and um, do try to point it out to people. Um, uh, I think <laughs> the people who get it will be the, the, the people in the pews before the, the pastors, unfortunately. That's helpful. Thank you. And I hope that's encouraging to some people <laughs> who might be in that situation. Yeah. I'm so grateful for your time today. I've really enjoyed this conversation. It's a topic I really enjoy and really enjoyed getting to read your book and kind of as a privilege to get to have this conversation. So thank you for that. I would love to allow you to close by if there's any final words you want to share, but also I would love for you to let people know if they've enjoyed this, where can they find more of your work? Oh, okay. Well, yes. Um, final word. Um, the gospel is, is good for us. Um, and sometimes it's good for us in the simplest way. It cheers you up, and that's a good thing. Um, don't don't be afraid to let you know this good word, this kind word from God, cheer you up. Um, God wants to cheer you up, because life is hard, and and we need to be cheered up. And it's glad tidings of great joy. Uh, so that's what I've been trying to write about, and so on for my whole life. Um, in addition to the books we mentioned at the beginning, um, there's yeah you know, these, these courses that um, that I taped um, on. Um, Luther, another one on Augustine, another one on history of Christian theology, all with the great courses. Um, I'll put in one more plug. Um, next year, uh, a, a book of mine on the Nicene Creed will be coming out. And um, the Nicene, it's a, it's a short book. If you don't know the Nicene Creed or want some help with it, uh, it should be helpful. And the Nicene Creed is, is a summary of the gospel. So um, it, it, it cheered me up. I mean, I'm writing another book about the gospel and ethics right now. And, and the more I think about the gospel, I, I sit there writing um, and I'm singing while I write uh, because it cheers me up. So um, I hope some of that cheers other people up um, because um, the gospel is meant to be go from mouth to ear, from mouth to ear and, and circulate. Um, so uh, glad tidings of great joy. Uh, may it be to you, too. That's a beautiful word and a wonderful place to end. Thank you so much. And thanks to everyone who watches this video sometime in the future, whenever that is. Don't take your time lightly, and I really appreciate it. Until next time, be on the lookout for more videos. And as always, go out and love God and love others, because truly, above all else, that will change the world.